Hello and welcome to The Arise interview where we take time to reflect on the big stories from the news and on the fortunes and affairs of the world in an hour of conversation with commentators, analysts and thought leaders. I'm Charles Anyegolu. Coming up in the next 60 minutes, Rosa Whitaker, a renowned entrepreneur and the first ever U.S. Assistance Trade Representative who served in the administrations of Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. It was Miss Whitaker who helped to craft the historic Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, or AGOA, that landmark piece of legislation that to date remains America's most consequential economic policy initiative towards Africa. And now she's unveiled a new Africa economic policy recommendation for the Biden administration. Rosa Whitaker, CEO and president of the Whitaker Group, and my special guest today in a moment. Plus, after 11 consecutive nights of bombardment, the skies over Israel and Gaza have fallen silent. A ceasefire between Israel and Palestinian militants has come into force in the past few hours after intense fighting which left hundreds dead. What did it take to stop the bombs and missiles that were raining down on Gaza and southern Israel? We'll get an analytical view of that breakthrough ceasefire. And later, calls for reform of the BBC following a scandal over a TV interview with Princess Diana 25 years ago. Prince William, heir to the British throne, has launched a scathing attack on the BBC after a highly critical report into the way it obtained that interview with his mother, the Princess of Wales. And her other son, Prince Harry, says her death played into his mental anguish. We have analysis coming up. Now, my first guest today, Rosa Whitaker, is the CEO and president of the Whitaker Group, a US and Africa based firm specializing in transaction advisory, investment facilitation, and project development on the continent. But well, that's just a fraction of the story. In addition to being an entrepreneur and former US policy leader with a track record of achievement driving investment into Africa, Ms. Whitaker also served as America's first ever assistant trade representative in the administrations of Presidents Bill Clinton and George W. Bush. She has been named one of Foreign Policy Magazine's top 100 global thinkers and is broadly recognized as the leading expert on Africa trade and global engagement. And she helped to craft the historic Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, or AGOA, which was enacted in 2000. Well, now she's championing uh, a new Africa economic policy approach for the Biden administration. We'll talk to her in a moment about that. But first, here she is speaking recently about the need to support growth in U.S. Africa trade. Well, I think technology and innovation is one of the greatest um, opportunities in Africa. We have a significant digital divide um, that we have to close globally. Um, American companies are leading in technology and innovation. And African countries, they have a natural strength towards this. When we look at 650 mobile money users in Africa and look at what the fintech sector is going. That's greater than Europe's um, and, and Africa's. Um, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa is leading the world in mobile money. And um, when we look at mobile money payments, more than 64% of them in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I'm delighted to say that Rosa Whitaker, CEO and president of the Whitaker Group, joins me now from Accra, Ghana. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. It's taken a while to set up this chat with you because you're, of course, a ferociously busy person. So we appreciate the time. So where would you say, first of all, that U.S. trade and investment policy is right now in Africa, 21 years after you helped to craft that historic bill, the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, that was supposed to herald a new dawn for trade relations between the U.S. and Africa? Thank you so much, and I'm so happy to be here. Let me just say that I believe that AGOA did herald a new dawn. Um, it ended an era 
of paternalism uh, in the U.S. approach to Africa and introduced an era of partnership. One of the greatest contributions of AGOA was changing the perception and how Americans viewed Africa. But that said, we still had a lot of untapped potential. Now, we wanted to expand trade in Africa, notably African exports to the U.S. We achieved that. We can say 21 years later, um, Africa has exported $75 billion in non-oil um, products to the U.S. If we include oil, we're talking about nearly a half a trillion. So that was good. And behind that number, there are jobs, even in one sector alone, when we look at the garment sector. AGOA has generated more than 1.4, uh, 1.3 million African jobs, not to mention those other sectors. So we got a job creation. And what happens when we get that job creation? We're talking about expanded incomes. We're talking about jobs that were largely um, dominated by African women who send their girls to school as well as boys. But what we did not do is we did not really achieve an investment response. We did not see U.S. Africa at, you know, at the pace and the rate that we had envisioned at Hope. But we knew that we would have a problem there because we put some things in AGOA that we never achieved. Africa needs an incredible amount of financing. We did not see um, a lot of financing. We did not anticipate China's um, quick rise in economic hegemony um, across Africa. So now we need to update our policy based on today's reality, modernize it, and build on what's working and really disrupt what's not working. Well, that's a very interesting point, and I want to get back to that AGOA in a moment. But I wanted to ask you, first of all, do you consider this to be a good moment for Africa in global trade and U.S. trade relations with Joe Biden in the White House? Well, I can say um, I believe we have an historic opportunity. Um, I've had the opportunity to work um, with then Senator Biden, uh, and he enthusiastically embraced AGOA. AGOA was not easy to do. I mean, we can say now because it's work, because for a nominal investment, we've gotten all of these results. Um, and, but it was very controversial because we were talking about opening up the U.S. market to anything made in Africa, uh, practically anything, without applying any duties, and it was unilateral. So we had a lot of pushback, but then Senator Biden stood strong and he was a champion in this Senate. Um, he is a leader who leads with his heart. So I do believe that it will be a good moment uh, for African trade, but I also believe that um, Africa has an important role to play because the solution that's sustainable will not come from the United States or an external partner. It's only when we marry our efforts and our efforts complement the work that African countries and governments are doing on the ground. So I do believe in President Biden, Africa will find a committed and willing partner. Um, and I believe he's a strong leader and he fundamentally cares about people. So as much as we can connect expanded trade to transformation of the human condition across Africa, I believe that he would embrace it wholeheartedly. Um, we've got a couple of minutes before we have to take a break. So if I have to interrupt you, I will, and you will continue after the break. But just broadly speaking, what is your new Africa policy recommendation for the Biden administration? I noticed that you've given it the working title of the U.S. Africa Accelerated Growth Initiative, which presumably is aimed at giving momentum to U.S. policy on trade and investment in Africa, among other things. You're absolutely correct. And I, I gave it that name because that's what we want to achieve at the end of the day. It's a four-pronged policy approach. 
first we must expand the trade. Um, we have to build on what's working in AGOA. And there are things that we have to do and things Africa has to do to um, make that happen. Uh, if you want to look at some of the things that we have to do, we have to build in reciprocity into AGOA. AGOA was unilateral. And now the, Washington has no appetite for unilateral trade. But what we have to do, we have to be smart about it. I don't think we need to yank countries out of AGOA because it's about to expire in four years. I think we should be thoughtful and graduate sectors. But in order to expand trade, we have to um, embrace in our policy the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is the most consequential um, initiative in Africa right now. We're talking about a GDP of $3.6 trillion, a market of over a billion people. We have to embrace that, support Afri African countries in getting behind that to make it work okay I'm, I'm going to interrupt you i really apologize for this but we'll come back and keep talking we've got to take a break you're watching the arise interview plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat with rosa whitaker former u.s assistant trade representative for presidents bill clinton and george w bush stay with us Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Sonia Gould. Now, as we look to the Biden administration, hoping for a reset and a more constructive and cooperative dialogue with the emerging economies in Africa, let's first hearken to my special guest today, Rosa Whitaker. She's the CEO of the Whitaker Group and first ever assistant US trade representative under both Presidents Clinton and George W. Bush. And she's come up with a recommendation about what the next US policy agenda for Africa Africa should look like. It includes how to reinvent that historic piece of legislation which she helped to craft 21 years ago, known as the Africa Growth and Opportunity Act, or AGOA, and how the African Continental Free Trade Agreement can create opportunities for a deeper U.S. policy agenda. She's calling it the U.S. Africa Accelerated Growth Initiative, and she hopes, as we all do, that it'll help to give momentum to U.S. Africa trade and investment flows. And Rosa Whitaker, CEO and president of the Whitaker Group, is still with me from Accra, Ghana. Thank you very much indeed for staying with us. And before I rather rudely interrupted you, and we had to go on a break, uh, I apologize for that. Uh, you were talking, uh, giving us your broad, the broad strokes of your new Africa policy recommendation for the Biden administration. Please continue. Let me just say the Biden administration will have to be bold if it's going to be effective. First, we have to expand the trade, and there's an appetite in Washington for uh, reciprocity. We can be smart about that. Um, there were some things we didn't achieve in AGOA, like we still have limitations on sugar and cotton from African countries. We're saying that we should unleash that, um, unlock that, because sugar and cotton are two commodities that African countries can do competitively, and we should work to add value to that. We should put the full force of the U.S. government in partnership with African countries on the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. This will be transformative, but the African Continental Free Trade Agreement cannot work as long as Africa is balkanized. I mean, we have to face it. There are too many countries in Africa um, independently operating um, to be effective as 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 uh, in trade. So unless we can, and this is a colo uh, you know a colonialism, a relic of colonialism, but nonetheless we have to deal with it. Unless we can form that kind of economic and even political federation, it will be hard for the continent of Africa to be competitive. So I'm suggesting as a priority to achieve that growth that we address this because we know that in the world, 3% um, of the people live in landlocked countries. In Africa, 30%. We need to disrupt that. And the second thing that um, pillar of the proposal is to unleash financing for African infrastructure uh, and other priorities in Africa. 
And we can do that by leveraging the $46 trillion U.S. bond market. We've never tried to do this before. Um, this is the only way I can see that we can constructively be competitive with China. And how do we do that? We provide guarantees. We have a very strategic partner we could do that with in Africa, the Afra Exim Bank. It is a trade bank. It is competitive. It has the capacity to be the issuers of the bond. And then that way we move the onus off of the U.S. budget and our deficit is um, really um, expanding. So we, there would be no political appetite for earmark. Um, but I believe that there would be an appetite to leveraging the U.S. bond market to provide um, low cost financing. Um, for, for Africa. And the third pillar would be for us to open up the U.S. tax code. We know that if you want to move the private sector, you open up the tax code and you incentivize the private sector. This is what China has done with this private sector. This is what we, we know that it works. I'll give you an example. In 1987, when Congressman Charlie Rangel passed legislation in the U.S. Congress, which basically said that any U.S. companies operating in apartheid South Africa to pay double taxes, they left. Um, it was the tax market. It was the tax code and that double taxation. So what I am suggesting is that why don't we say for all the U.S. companies that invest in strategic sectors in Africa, those sectors that are transformative, you can repatriate your uh, profits back to the U.S. tax-free, and we will even give you a development credit on some of those investments, um, creating this kind of enterprise zones in Africa. I believe that would be uh, tremendously beneficial, and it would have a mutually beneficial effect. And especially when you marry it with the bond market, because even with the bond market idea, we want to build in an initiative where for all of those countries who are the recipients of this bond, they also have to agree to take a percentage of those funds to buy America. That would make it politically feasible and it would also build in that kind of reciprocity that Washington wants to see. And finally, the fourth pillar of my proposal, which is going to be very difficult, I think we need to disrupt this entire aid model. No country of the world has developed um, economically through aid. Um, and even African countries have been surprised to learn that bilateral aid to Africa is about, over the past 10 years, is about $89 billion. And people are saying, well, where's the money? I surmise, I believe, I can't prove because it operates in a very opaque way that most of that money is still in Washington in the hands of a labyrinth of NGOs and consulting firms where that money goes. About 25 firms occupy the majority of that money and they're supposed to be the distributors or the executors of aid across Africa and it's not working and it has enriched them and I'm calling on the Biden administration to finally disrupt this approach that everyone knows it's not working. Um, on, I, we do not see the impact of Africa uh, on Africa on the ground and use that money differently. I think USAID should be relegated to humanitarian assistance and disaster release. And we use that money for development assistance. We still include the essentials, investments in human capital, uh, investments in health, but we disperse it, we design it differently, keeping most of that money on the ground, closer to the people in Africa. I'd rather even see um, some partnerships with a lot of African organizations um, dispersing this, this aid. So we gotta get rid of the aid model. I use an example. We, uh, USAID, has had put in $10 billion in Afghanistan, yet 47 more than 47% are the people still live below the poverty line. And then when we look at Vietnam, that took a different approach. We have 
of the people living below the poverty line. And what was Vietnam's approach? They incentivized trade, investments, enterprise development. So the approach I'm talking about, I am confident, would create enterprises across Africa that would employ people, expand incomes, and it would be transformed. Okay, now that is an absolutely, not only fantastic an analysis of, of um, the, 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 the scene, sort of African trade vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, but I mean, your, your recommendations, absolutely brilliant, including the ones about the bond market and, uh, and, and all the rest of it. I mean, we've got less than a minute, sadly. Um, what's your sense of how the Biden administration is likely to react to these recommendations? Do you have any sense at all of how they might react to it? And we've got about 40 seconds. Well, I think that so far is resonating very well. And I have confidence that President Biden wants to do the right thing. Um, he has a very strong team on Africa around him. I believe the development community will probably of the status quo will probably fight this and they have quite a large war chest but i just hope african governments will speak up and african civil society okay. will make their views known to washington i want to say thank you very much indeed rosa uh, rosa whittaker who served as the america's first ever assistant trade representative in the administrations of bill clinton and george w bush and who is ceo of the Whitaker Group. You're watching the Arise interview, plenty more still ahead, including what now that the skies over Israel and Gaza have fallen silent. We'll take stock of the latest ceasefire and assess what's next for both sides. Stay with us.